So uh, we're going to talk about ooh, okay, marketing and employee engagement, and more importantly, how to be a badass in 2018. What does it mean to be a badass? And why does it matter? It's actually very topical what it means to be a badass because badass to me means being authentic, being who you are. And as we talk about historically about how people behave and what they buy and what they decide to like and not to like, you realize that there was kind of a path and conformity was very important. Well, we live in an age where that conformity is less and less important. As a matter of fact, unconformity is actually the trend. And for me, being a badass is not necessarily about the rings you wear or the clothes or the talk, but it's really that attitude about knowing who you are, own it and make a difference. So 2018 for me is a perfect year to actually talk about badass and badasses. This is actually someone that will come back at the very end of the presentation. who will recognize the artist there without reading the Rolling Stone. Who knows who that is? Cardi B indeed and we're actually gonna have Cardi B at the end and kind of have a little fun about the hip-hop version that she has of songs. Here's a very interesting concept of a, what a badass is. Can you believe this is the same guy? <laughs> Jeff Bezos in 1998 hawking books and trying to convince people in New York literary houses that actually there was a valid business to have to sell books. So you had to be those people, right? I mean, obviously it's a little bit like crunch here, but this is typically what you can imagine people who dress in 1998 when they were selling books. And this is him today. This is a Jeff Bezos that is a frequent target of our president as owner of the Washington Post that is creating offshoots of his business that are extremely promising and more importantly in that old badassery thing and I'm not just talking about being being puffed and healthy which obviously he is but owning who he is and developing it and I think that's very very important as we move forward you cannot be successful in social media today if you don't own your content and who you are if you don't have that insight of yourself and your company, there's no real need to be on social media, especially considering that you don't even own those medium. Little housekeeping here, you can have a copy of the presentation right now. So what I would like you to do is to pull up your phone, smartphones, anything that you have with a connection to the internet and actually just send out an email to that email address. It's live, L-I-V-E, at saison.com. And I'm going to take like two minutes to wait for you guys to catch up because then you will immediately get a copy of that presentation. So, the joy of Twitter. Do you remember the first tweet? Wasn't that amazing, the ability to not have to pay text messaging charges, which is why Twitter was limited to 140 characters? Anyone remember those days? where actually texting was kind of weird between people. We were used to phone and then Twitter came and tell, well, there's a different way we can interact. And whatever you send, we're going to also at all cost send it through the text message that you have on your phone. And the co-founder of Twitter and literally, and we're very comfortable by saying, we don't know where this is going to go, but we know there's something here that can change. And what it changed is, the ability of people to communicate worldwide. Twitter has recorded on the server every single tweet ever sent. I don't think anyone could have imagined at the time what is going on on Twitter today, which by the way, to the credit of our president, Twitter stock is actually going up and more people are using Twitter since it's been elected. Now, um, you can see behind me and it's completely at best unsettling to see the exchange that we're seeing on Twitter between, you know, the leader of the free world and a foreign leader. But this is our reality. This is 2018. People find a way to communicate own it. And nobody can deny our president the ability to say, I own Twitter. 
bypassing traditional media and making your own reality. I find it absolutely admirable. Now, by the way, the response from Kim Jong-un, interesting choice, by the way. Uh, everyone had to Google it and then realize what it actually means. I guess they haven't really pulled up recent. I should go and talk to them about Cardi B over there into the English. That would be very interesting. Kind of a blast from the past there. But it did not do use Twitter. It was just an official press release from, from the government. So as we think about 2018, what it means, and freeing up from conformity, there's no real boundaries of what is accepted or not accepted. And it's the same for our traditional social media. If there's anything as a traditional social media, I'm going to challenge it and say no. There are two companies that rule the internet. Which one are they? Facebook and? Well, Twitter is definitely a third one, and Google. Google owning YouTube, Google owning a lot of traffic. It's not being reflected on the sites, but um, Google is omnipresent, Android platform, and all of that. So those two that Joe Pulley is responsible for about 80 to 85% of all the internet in terms of people engagement. Facebook owns WhatsApp, Facebook owns Facebook Messenger, which is three of the four most downloaded apps all over the world. YouTube obviously is owned by Google. So out of that, there are crumbs, and obviously Instagram, which belongs to Facebook. So really, when you look at it, you say, wow, this is, this is almost a monopoly. And what do people do when they have monopoly? They change the rules. We've seen that very recently with Facebook. We're going to come back to it because it has an impact on the way us, we, brand, communicate. Traditionally, Facebook was one of the first early innovators to allow brand to have likers and actually get their message seen. People could react to it. Well, this is going down to oblivion as of last week which is a good thing for a certain way and more challenging for others. Depending on the demographic you're going after, you have to pick and choose. Younger demographic, what do they use? Instagram and Snapchat. Snapchat had a hard time last year. They're coming back a little. The growth of users has intensified. They realize that the spectacles doesn't really matter and what people really want is continued innovation from the site. Every time Snapchat come up with a killer release, it's being copied blatantly by Instagram and other, other sites. So it's really hard to configure in that space. Frankly, as marketers, this is not our problem unless you own stock or you work there. What you're interested in is what is a message and how are you going to reach out to your audience? How are you going to make money? Right? Many people make a lot of money on the internet. It's not like super trendy to talk about YouTubers because it's so like a year and a half ago. And it is. But there's still an amazing amount of money being made by YouTuber. It still, to me, surprises me how the creativity of the human persona and the ability to create live channels with the marketing power of Google that basically decide which is going to be in and out, generate so much revenue. YouTube look at themselves as not just a media company, as a television, as a channel that needs to compete for ads dollars against CBS and ABC and all the others. So we talked about Facebook and how Facebook basically decided to restrict the posting of the brands in a news feed of the users. What does that mean exactly for us as marketers or for you that is using Facebook? It means that you have to, at best, coach your likers to change their settings to say which brand they like so they can still show up. By default, you won't. And even if you do that, 
if people do not like or have some kind of um, sharing very early on in your postings, it's not going to be seen. So really, to me, it comes back to this. Any fan of... <laughs> nice, good one. And I, it's totally on me, that one, because, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you when. <laughs> we only have like one sound system, and we, I cannot talk over the video. Any fan of a family guy? Yeah. Very funny show. I mean, it gets kind of old, frankly, after like 10 seasons. But it's still cutting edge in many different ways. And that scene is only 30 seconds long. Brian the dog has a huge issue, and he calls 911 which of course is being answered by Joe, the, the cop. And he talks for like two minutes about the problem and he needs help and all of this. And this is what happens. You must be pretty tired from thinking about all this. You ever get bags under your eyes? What? I've been using this eye cream. It's done wonders for me. It's made by a company called Rodan and Fields. Have you heard of them, Brian? Yeah, I, I think, uh... Oh, they make terrific stuff. In fact, I was such a fan, I became a sales consultant for the company. Listen, Joe, I gotta run. I'm hosting a little get-together tomorrow night if you want to stop by. There's gonna be pizza and soft drinks. Then a man's gonna talk about the whole line. Can I go ahead and confirm your attendance? So, is that the future of Facebook? Probably not. But it really does pushes you to start looking at inbound marketing in a different way. And when you do get people's attention, whatever, whatever the attention is, you got to grab it because getting people's attention is pristine. And even if it comes out as super awkward like this, by the way, the set speech on this is amazing. Like the follow up, uh, the, do you like this product? And I became a sales consultant. We're doing a little get together tomorrow, the pizza and can I confirm you in? It's just it's like textbook direct selling techniques. Let's talk about inbound methodology because the really nice thing about 2018 to me is that we get a lot more ability to understand that we can refine our marketing channels. It is clear now, even if you are completely B2C, completely targeted to our consumers, there are heavy users of Facebook and, and they like to share stuff, you just cannot grow your business just using uh, social media alone. Um, first you have to advertise a lot. And even if Facebook is fairly cost effective, it's still a lot of money to pull out. So the nice thing about inbound marketing is that you have a little bit more control over the whole process. You have different channel that you can interact with. One of the leading uh, company about that is, um, is HubSpot. But the concept is as old as, as selling. Uh, it's just that a, a way to look at it that is consistent. So, what you want really is to go from the attraction all the way to the delight. And then you have different content here that you want to get your people in the different stages of buy to be interested in. Example, social media, blog, all of this is really about the early stage. It's about catching. It's people thinking like, yeah, yeah, that'd be nice. That'd be, I never really thought about it. That would be kind of an interesting thing to do. I never really consider it. And as you move the person, then you become too into more like the direct selling, the CRM, the workflows, the, okay, well, let's meet. Let's meet tomorrow. Let's follow up. Oh, you missed that meeting. No problem. Let's have another meeting the next day. So you have to caliber your inbound depending on those different stages. It's actually not very complicated. It just requires some um, follow through, but it's not very complicated. Um, those are kind of the six things you own without the social media aspect, but at least you can post on it. We're going to come back on like some badass word that you guys need to know. There's some of them there. Are website irrelevant? No, of course not. They are more and more relevant today, especially that they are so mobile friendly that people can act, chat, pretty much do anything they want on a website. So no, your website is extremely important. The way you define your website is very important today. Very, very, very important. 
blog, I'm going to say it's a hit and miss on our experience as an agency. First, you have to always remember that there's truly never an original blog post, ever. So the real question is, how much energy do you want to post? I'm sorry, do you want to spend creating those posts? I was talking to a CEO yesterday and he was telling me how frustrated he can be where he created a post and he, he spent an hour and a half creating that post, that content, follows all the rules and he gets 30 likes. The next day he posts something about Inc. Magazine and he gets 175. So the question is, what is the most efficient? In truth, though, you cannot always rely on third-party content and just repost. You need to develop a certain amount of your own. But the metrics, at the end of the day, decide for you. Social media, we talked about it. You can post at Vita and Eternam. What's really more important is finding the right social media account. LinkedIn, for all its wonderful ability to penetrate the business world still does not get any traction in terms of content. You may post there, don't be excited too much because you're not going to get a lot of traction there. What you will get though is the ability to connect with people and people will read their email and they will read those messages. So it's a great way to interact and connect with people and develop your strategy. Landing pages customized landing pages, ideally to the client or potential client needs. Very cheap, very easy to do. It's a link. You can have almost an unlimited amount. Calls to action. Why are we doing this in the first place? A white paper, uh, a preview, an exclusive event. And then um, I will add a, a thank you page because that's an important part of it, and um, the good old-fashioned email. Be happy if your campaign has an open rate anywhere above 30%. That's a new standard. So if you have an email list of, let's say, you know, 1,000, you get 300 people opening your email, you should be pretty satisfied. The industry average is about 17. So that's where we are. We talked about the buyer's journeys. For those of you that were able to uh, or are interested in getting a copy of this, just, just keep it, look at it. There's kind of idealized version of a content depending on the buyer's journey. There's no need for me to spend too much time on this. If you have questions, let me know now or, or later on. Big fan of this. We actually just recently implemented that ability to have a live chat on the website of, uh, of Aperi. And uh, this is a, actually, this particular one is a free add-on that does not require any coding skill, works with smartphones, so you don't have to have customer agent at the ready. You can have people just doing their, their day, working on something else, and then when there's a connection on your website, you get an alert. And we just had a story we talked about with Anthony at our last meeting, which is someone was trying to connect. By the time, Anthony, you went online, it was a little bit too late. But all that information got secured and he was able to come back to the person and arrange a meeting. The nice thing about those two is that you can actually physically see which page the person is going and how long they stay on the site, which is an incredibly valuable feature when you decide which pages you want to push. Why do you want a live chat on your site? Because people are used to it. It's convenient. They may be at work and they still want to uh, buy something from you. That's a way to get that interaction. Another thing that you may want to consider, we big proponent of LinkedIn campaign. Once you connect with someone on LinkedIn, always, by the way, we specialize in CEOs. You're much more likely to get CEOs to connect with other CEOs than to connect with your sales guy. So don't even try. It's kind of uh, embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> but CEO to CEO connection works. I know we had more 400 CEOs since we started about a year and a half ago here. And we do the same for every client. This is a different client down in Houston. And what we do once the connection is done is actually part of the campaign through LinkedIn 
is uh, in that particular example having a, a, a lunch trio meeting and basically inviting the person that we know is a qualified prospect. In that particular instance, we're looking for a company that has to have at least $20 million revenue in the Houston area to be able to be a qualified prospect. So we check through different tools, including LinkedIn. Once I accept the connection, we wait two days and then we send out those messages. In that particular example, I might be interested, is this just networking? Well, we have an opening. Now it's a question about the heartfulness of the follow-up to be able to close that deal. When you do B2B social media or marketing, if you are selling to $20 million revenue plus companies in Houston, there's exactly 6,000 of them, more or less. Well, you're not interested in 6,001. You're interested in exactly those companies and exactly the CEOs. All the rest will distract you from it. So do not shy away from being laser focused in your campaigns. Those are the bad words, the badass words that I want you to really remember because those are key to the balance and the success of your social media and campaigns for 2018. They're not super sexy, but when you do it right, they will bring efficiency and result to your campaign. What is a long tail keyword? It's a keyword that is more than just one or two words in it. What is the market that you want to own? Well, go to there and then keep adding adjectives until it comes to a complete sentence. What we've seen on the internet in the last probably, well, it started about five years ago and definitely in the last two years that people type entire sentence. They don't just want a custom home in Chicago. They want to know who is the best builder in the Northwest suburbs in Chicago with a five star review. Well, if that's your long tail keyword, then put that into the description of your website. Put that into everything that you do. The call to action, it is a waste if you don't trigger people to act. If they're interested, you need an action. The action will actually validate your campaign. And you can have those call to action in many different ways. It can be a phone number, it can be a click through, it can be receiving something, whatever it is, track it. The buyer persona starts with, I mean, you know, it makes sense, persona with this person. It starts with your own customer today. Extrapolate them or decide that this is a good customer and this is the bad customer. And we want more of the good. And that's a really good way to do marketing, by the way. Having complete awareness of, you know, the time where you're just saying yes to customers, but they actually are not paying the bills on time or, or they're just a pain or they require you extra work. Well, somehow there's a profile for that that you want to eliminate. Once you get your buyer persona, use that. Extrapolate it into the marketplace. There are many tools you can use, not so much a traditional tool as just looking on LinkedIn and social media as an email addresses and, and geodata as well. We've talked about the buyer journey already. We've talked about the landing page. For me, a thank you page is as important as a landing page. A thank you page say, yes, thank you so much for downloading our white paper. And then you add a little bit more information. You add an expected, maybe future call for action. You, you show them that you've appreciated what they've done. At the end of the day, I think that concept of CAT is just what it is, the right content at the right audience with the right timing. And not being that person. What are we seeing here? We're seeing a LinkedIn post from a financial advisor that uses a language that is pretty direct. Actually, start with the B word, so that's like the second word. And that's interesting that in today's environment, some people are comfortable having those kind of posts on LinkedIn because what they do is they don't spend the time to really study their audience. I actually spent, because I was like, hey, there's such a good chokehold and this kind of thing that just makes my day. 
So I spent some time looking at the metrics of the post and looking at this company and who's responding to it. And for the audience that this person has, Facebook, Pinterest and other sites are perfect. LinkedIn, not so much. Because on LinkedIn, there is still a wide majority of people that like to keep it personal. I'm sorry, uh, uh, separated business and, and personal. And as a matter of fact, that didn't took long after I saw the post. And then one person kind of complained about it. Then the person doubled down, like a lot of young content owners tend to do, by explaining that if you could save one person from imminent death, then that will be pretty much, you know, doing the right thing anyway. And then the person come back at it and say, well, actually this person agrees with me, which is funny because he tagged that person. <laughs> It's important to write content at the right time in the right channel. More than just having the right content all the time. Call to action. You go to the website of the Chicago-based company, although they just, just, just moved to Texas. It's called Grunt Style. I'm actually going to see the RFS says tomorrow. Their concept is, uh, it was founded by um, a former drill instructor from the army and they have this paramilitary gear and paraphernalia and they've grown tremendously in the last five years. Everything they do on social media cater to that audience. As soon as you get on a website, you have this very clever way to spin the wheel if you want like coupon, for example. And what I want to give your attention to is on the little kick that they had. Every email address kills a terrorist. Every email address kills a terrorist. What does that mean? Well, for the audience, it's fun. If I put my email address, although like literally a terrorist is not going to be killed, probably not. I really don't know, but I will know tomorrow and I'll definitely circle back on you. <laughs> Hopefully it'll be the ki bad kind. But the point is they know their audience and you can push that edge up to a certain amount. And even if, let's say, you're not the right person for this audience, that's completely fine. They are growing at double digit with this kind of edgy marketing. What we're going to see and talk about hip hop and the use of profanity, although we're going to hear about the non-explicit version, that's pushing the edge. You can actually push the edge in any single part of your marketing, as long as you know your audience and how much you can get away with. This is the badassery we're talking about at the beginning. This is an example of it. Again, you may or may not be the right person for it, but that's not the question. The question is, will the right person be more inclined to put their email address? And the answer is yes. That makes sense? Yes. Little tip for you, you're welcome. Use any... There. <laughs> I've never been a big fan of Apple TV. There's always a lag at some point into the Wi-Fi system. In any case, uh, 74 way to optimize your post. <coughs> it works. And frankly, if you decide to create content, you'll be better used to have a title that encompass one of those than just create something more traditional. Every single study show it. It's not clickbait. It's just going straight to the essence of what people are ready to deal with on the internet, which is if you don't have a good grabber and a follow up of two or three sentences after your content is simply not going to be shared and enjoyed. Now, the next thing is kind of to help all of us that are struggling to write properly in our post.
Um, I'm a big fan of Grammarly. Who's using it? Right, the free version at the very least. If you can spare the dough, it's about $100 a year. And for your team, please go, uh, get the premium version because it gives you conceptual writing. It allows you to put sense into your sentence and just makes you write so much better, it's not even funny. And you learn from it. If you think about how, you never know how bad word spelling is, like the word, like, you know, the Microsoft Word, how bad it is until you start using that. And then you never, ever, 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 never, ever use that. And it's embedded into the internet. So whatever you use as a site, it will just correct it for you. It's a wonderful thing. Or if one of your pet peeves is some people in your team that just cannot write for their life and you're so sick of those emails, it's like a little gift. <laughs> you're welcome. Another little gift just for us until we move to the next, some life hacks. <coughs> oh, I love those life hacks. You just Google life hack and you have like literally thousands of them. How to make life better. Have you ever used that pepper clips thing? Yeah. I swear it changed my life. Like on a, on, a, on, a, on a road, you just put this and it doesn't fall on the floor. You don't write on. <laughs> Are you kidding me? It's like I'll hack this anytime. It's, it's amazing. Amazing. <laughs> little things in life. Let's, let's sever the little victories, you know? It helps. I'm going to browse for this so we can come back and finish on time. But more, more or less, this is, this is the, the kind of the spread of the generational um, numbers that we have in our country today uh, between the veterans, silent generation, all the way to Generation Z. Uh, most people assume that millennials go on forever, but actually, no. <laughs> generation Z which is where most people agree is a name actually have started since and they're about to start working with us and older one are just late teens and they are different than millennials first they grew up in a recessionary time as opposed to the millennials so their outlook in life is different that's that's one of the main 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 difference and obviously technology is part of them but in a different way what's important to comprehend really is how the work ethic has changed throughout the different generations. The veterans used to have on average six jobs in their lifetime and will define themselves by the quality of their work. Generation Y millennial are likely to have about 27 jobs by the time they retire. So they've kind of shift that where they say, well, I'm the CEO of my own life and I'm going to make things work for me does not mean that this generation is lazy at all. It's just a different sense of focus. And one of the way to look at it is a lot of veterans were born with those kind of level into the hierarchy of needs. Well, the, 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 uh, depending on where you live between 60% and 80% of the generation of uh, American starts from the self-factorization and up. So obviously the outlook in life is very, very different. In one, you're very happy to have a job. You're happy to have food on the table. You're happy to have a day off a week. On the other one, it's already granted. It's what's next. And I know it's hard. And there's a lot of cringe that comes out of it. But it's also empowering because once you know and that comes with the badassery once you know what you are good at and once you know who you are then you can do a lot of things with that including refusing to settle down for certain kind of jobs That generation loves to travel and loves to work and travel. There are organizations that starts to have an entire industry dedicated to talking to HR of large company and tell them, well, you have two options. Option A, your millennial is going to leave after two years and there's nothing you can do about that. Or option B, you actually give them the ability to work abroad from Prague 
or whatever cities for six months and they will come back and still work for you. And we're going to facilitate that. We're going to take care of the visa. We're going to take care of the travel. And actually, it's not going to get you that much more money because they will take the pay cut and they'll work out of an Airbnb and a co-working space, which is extremely inexpensive. So watch for this because it's happening more and more. That's a trend in 2018. We know about this. I'm not going to spend too much time on it. Working from home is not the end all be all. You need to find a way in between. Working from home can be not just lonesome, uh, counterproductive after a while. So it's important to find like the right amount of interaction that matters for your company while still allowing people to work from anywhere. I cringe every time I see that number. Only 29% of employees in our country are fully engaged. We've got to do something about that. And the nice thing about younger generation is they are much more um, direct about what they want. And they will tell you if you ask. And even if you don't ask, they'll tell you anyway. So might as well ask. So you feel like you're in charge on that one. <laughs> I love companies that put in their website what they believe in. Not just their goal, but actually their values. This is one among like thousands. Uh, this one happens to be mixed cloud because I was listening to music when it happened and it just popped. But look at this. Obviously, you cannot read it from there. I'm aware of this. They talk about, we focus on meritocracy. That's a strong statement. That's appealing. The more hours you put, the harder you work, the more you get promoted. That's the way it should be. And if that's the way your company works and it should be, then put it out there and be proud of those standards. We're about five minutes out from Cardi B. Before we get there, um, I always like to put, especially like the end, beginning of the year, like some kind of new product that gets super excited. And over the years, I featured like the drone delivery from Amazon that has been approved actually in other countries, not quite yet for hours. Uh, Self-driving cars. Um, and things that just like make you reflect. This is an old product. This is called Microsoft HoloLens. And the reason that I still love it, and I believe this is going to help us more than Oculus and other Google virtual realities because it's based on holograms. This is happening. They're selling it finally. Microsoft had a complete shift in the change CEOs. It's been three years already. And they've decided to be much more realistic into what people like and don't like and where they, they're putting their money. This is one of the things that I think is going to help us the most in the workplace. Microsoft HoloLens brings holograms into your real world. Using transparent lenses, spatial sound, and an understanding of your environment, holograms look and sound like they're actually part of the world around you. That is mixed reality. With Microsoft HoloLens, holograms are viewed through the holographic frame centered in the middle of your view. This preserves your peripheral vision so you can move freely and connect and collaborate with people around you. Holograms in mixed reality don't block out what you can see and hear. This enables you to engage with digital content and tools alongside the objects in your real world. Holograms can be world-locked in a physical location, so you can walk around them, or they can travel with you. You can even hear them in 3D with spatial sound. Microsoft HoloLens is the world's first fully untethered, self-contained holographic computer. With the mixed reality experience of HoloLens, you can stay in the real world and interact with real people as you simultaneously explore 3D in 3D. What, what is amazing about this is it's not about immersing yourself in virtual reality and living in a different or what feels like a different life. 
It's really about superimposing in what you see layers that matters to what it is that you're doing at that moment. Whether, as you can see, it's like looking at different parts or, or interacting with your environment, it's completely possible now for those uh, goggles because they are, as I mentioned, untethered. They were by themselves. I've actually had a chance to see like the first version two years ago and it's, it's improved a lot. And I believe that those holograms are really a way that's going to really bring technology to more applications. And not in the future like now. Yeah, <laughs> finally, the grand finale. So what we're going to hear is a solo of Cardi B into the song from Easy G called No Limit. And this is the, um, what is it, non-explicit expli non -explicit version, yeah. right? So the, the cut version or whatever it is, out of respect for your ears. More importantly, what we're going to do is we're going to actually listen to it, try to understand what she says and what she means. And appreciate the cleverness, the cleverness of hip hop in general, but particularly about this individual artist. So to put some perspective into Cardi B, um, Beyonce is definitely the rock standard of in today's environment, female black artist. Someone that came up in the last four years, three years really specifically, that kind of pushed the envelope is um, uh, Nicki Minaj. Cardi B comes from the same kind of hip hop culture. She's from the Bronx. She's actually a Latina. And uh, she has been able in less than a year to just break out. She was the first female artist in the last 20 years in hip-hop to actually be number one with a single called Boda Kielo, which you should absolutely listen, it's amazing. And currently she has three songs in the top 100 billboard. She has an attitude, I'm not going to lie to you, <laughs> and it's overly sexualized. But, but we're going to actually look at five words that she say and try to guess which one it is and what it means. Oops, 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 oops. Yeah, I'm going to play the song. So just follow up on the... And I, I love how she says Saison. It sounds like Saison. <laughs> it's put a white boy on Saison. I don't know what that means, but. So, what does she mean when she says Rolly? Is it one Rolls Royce, Rolex, Disney character, weed, or going with the flow? I'm going to let you think about it and, oh, is there a lag? Yeah. yeah. <coughs> so, get some money from the Rolly. So, what is Rolly? Come on, guys. Weed. Weed? weed? No, it's not weed. <laughs> yes, it's not Rolls Royce, it's Rolex. <laughs> All right, number two, Ghost. Is that Casper? Is that uh, the software semantic, phantom, shadow, or dead? Yeah. Phantom is a Rolls Royce. That's ghost. Number three, we have Jared. Are we talking about Jared Leto? Jared Kushner? I don't know what that would fit, <laughs> but you know, it's a Jared. Is it a generic for every other white guy? Is it the ex-subway guy? 
or is it just a uh, uh, slang for white powder? Huh? Which one? The subway guy, absolutely. Ex spokesperson, which I believe is in jail right now, will deserve time. And this is where it becomes really genius because this is what she says. Uh, where is it? Where is it? Yeah. Can you stop with all the subs? Expletive, I am Jared. So, what are we talking about the subs? Are we talking about subs as in substitute, an inferior version of me? Are we talking about subliminal tweets? Are we talking about subway sandwiches and the reference with Jared? Are we talking about the translation, sub? Or are we talking about subpar? Absolutely. Do you guys know what a subtweet is? Is when you reference someone, everyone knows who they are, but you don't use their name. She has been hit by that a lot, and that's what she says. And that's why she's using Jared as in sub from Subway, and that's hilarious, I think. <laughs> and very, very clever. And we're finishing with Mo. Is it Moi de Chandon, the French champagne? Yeah. yeah. And we have a winner. Thank you so much, guys. <laughs>